This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Garib, funded in part by TheStreet.com and Action Alerts Plus, where Jim Cramer and fellow portfolio manager Stephanie Link share their investment strategies, stock picks, and market insights. You can learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. Big finish. Stocks are on pace for another strong year of gains. What does 2015 hold for equities? And what are some must-own names for the new year? Buy or rent? Home price gains are slowing while rents are soaring. Will 2015 be the year more renters turn into homeowners? And writing the rules. New banking restrictions are coming. That could mean big changes for that industry. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Tuesday, December the 30th. Good evening, everybody. Yes, only one more day left in the year. I'm Bill Griffith in tonight for Tyler Matheson. And I'm Susie Garib. Good evening from me as well. Just as Bill said, only one more day of trading left in 2014. And what a year it has been for Wall Street. With unprecedented gains, the Dow broke through the 18,000 mark and the S&P topped 2,000 both for the first time ever. But today, stocks ended modestly lower. The Dow lost 55 points, closing back below that 18,000 level. The Nasdaq fell by 29, and the S&P was down by 10 points, retreating from yesterday's all-time closing high. So which sector saw the biggest gains this year? Topping the list, utilities, up 28 percent, followed by healthcare, which rose 24 percent, and technology, higher by 21 percent. And it's no surprise that the worst performing sector was energy, down 9 percent, with oil on track for its biggest annual drop since 2008. Telecoms were flat on the year and materials rose by only 6 percent. Well, that struggling energy sector is where Mark Lucchini sees investment opportunities in the new year. As we continue our week-long conversation with our market monitors, we turn tonight to Mark for his stock picks for 2015. He's chief investment strategist at Janney Montgomery. Mark, always good to see you. Welcome. You as well, Bill. Thank you. Um, we are finishing five great years for the U.S. equity market. Can we continue in the new year in the same pace, do you think? I don't know about the same pace, but I think directionally, yes. So we're looking for positive returns from equities in 2015. And once again, better returns than that which you should expect to get out of bonds and cash. So once again, risk-based assets we've advocated should continue to be in equities. But we do expect there to be more volatility in 2015. So investors need to brace for that but not abandon uh, their long mm -hmm. equity strategy. So, as Bill mentioned as he was introducing you, you do like some uh, energy stocks, and uh, let's let's start with your first uh, with your first choice here, which is I have Helmick, Helmick and Payne. Payne. Yeah, yeah Helmick and Payne. Yes, uh, HP. Why do you like it? A couple of reasons, Susie. It's primarily North American disposed. About 75 percent of its $4 billion in revenues is uh, derived from North America. It has a state-of-the-art platform and, and drilling rig uh, exposure across the United States. Uh, as a result, it's a much more efficient user on the part of producers in terms of being able to not only extract uh, energy but move to where energy sites might be more productive. Uh, it's been beaten up, clearly. The share price was halved from the high in July of this year until recently touching $60, although it's rallied here to about $67 a share. Uh, we think earnings, while they're being trimmed for 2015, still should support its dividend payout, which is over 4 percent, 4.1 right now to be precise. So it's attractive in terms of having a high current dividend income. And as well, the prospects that stabilization finally will come to oil prices, which is our base case, later in the second half of 2015. Yeah. And share prices are depressed mm -hmm. in that space. Okay. Mark, you make a bet on home builders in 2015. They're all really kind of still waiting for buying to begin in earnest so they can build in earnest. But you're doing this through an ETF. Tell us about this one and why you're betting on the home builders. Sure. Uh, certainly for the home builders, uh, we like the prospects of strengthening domestic economic conditions coupled with job growth. Obviously, as was mentioned earlier, it's breeding in terms of household formation a wave of renters, which we think some will migrate into the home buying marketplace. And with obviously uh, some loosening in credit conditions and very low mortgage rates, it makes affordability mm -hmm. relatively decent. Why that particular way to approach it is rather than trying to pick the one single home builder that would stand to benefit predicated 
upon its home price uh, uh, that it locks the market into or by virtue of the region in which it uh, constructs homes. We like sort of a proxied approach to buying exposure to that space. Mm -hmm. And ITB, we think, is the most home builder centric ETF with the top five positions being the DR Hortons, the Lennars, the NV Ryans, the Pulteys right. of the world representing 45 percent of that ETF. All right. So, Mark, we have about a half a minute left. Tell us about your health care pick, Med Assets. That's MDAS on the NASDAQ. Now, this stock is trading at the same price it was at the beginning of the year. So why should people put new money in now? Round trip in terms of a share price, mostly in sympathy with what's taking place in the small cap space at large. So not a, that unusual trading about 14 times earnings. It basically designs and sells software to the healthcare uh, industry in an effort to promote a greater operational and financial performance. And so we think it's a growth industry. It's all U.S. based, so should benefit from once again stronger economic conditions here, and as well more patients going into hospitals for care. Mark Lucini of Janney Montgomery. Always good to see you, Mark. Happy New Year. You as well. Thank you. Same Thanks. to you, Bill. Well, that kind of outlook for stocks, along with lower gas prices and a robust labor market, helped send consumer confidence higher in December. In the conference board's final reading this year, consumer confidence ended, edged up this month on a more favorable view of current economic conditions. Back to housing. The U.S. home prices rose again in October, but that growth rate has slowed down for the 11th month in a row. The Case-Shiller Home Price Index for the nation's 20 largest cities show that home prices rose just 4.5 percent in October from the same month a year ago. But that's the smallest monthly gain in prices we've seen in two years. Well, the housing market might be recovering in fits and starts, but the rental market is stronger than ever. But uh, stronger, however, means more expensive, and there's little relief in sight. Diana Olick has more. The only thing soaring higher than construction cranes this year were apartment rents. It's pretty outrageous to try to find affordable rent in this area. That's San Jose, California, but it's the same story in much of the nation. Renters paid a collective $20 billion more in rent this year than they did last year, according to Zillow. That's $312 a year per renter. It might not sound like a lot, but some metro markets are far worse. In San Francisco, rents rose 14 percent this year, and they also jumped by double digits in Denver and Pittsburgh. In the New York City area, renters paid 10 percent of the total rent paid in the entire country. So why don't renters just buy a home? The rents are so high that you can't save any money to put aside for a down payment. 31-year-old Jenny Sirocco wants to buy a house with her husband, but a down payment would cost her a full year's salary. People entering the labor market have, have struggled. They've been underutilized. They haven't seen the wage gains that you normally would. So all of that means that people probably will be renters for a bit longer. Apartment developers started construction on more new rental units this year than they have in 25 years. And in time, that should help ease these sky-high rents. But with rents still expected to rise further next year, renters will be forced to focus more on the math. I think millennials will come back into the market now. I think they'll think twice about, should I spend all this money on rent, spend slash waste all this money on rent, or should I just, you know, buy something? Because despite everything that's happened in housing, I don't want to throw my money away. I want to have something towards retirement that, you know, is worth something. Home ownership still seems to be the American dream. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. Well, the numbers are in for the final tally of the Americans who signed up for health insurance through the Affordable Care Act's healthcare.gov website. The Department of Health and Human Services that says that six and a half million people enrolled in a plan through the federal marketplace. That includes first time signups and subscribers automatically re-enrolled from last year. Another 600,000 found a plan through one of the 14 state websites that are not using the federal government's marketplace. From health care to banking, the banking industry was granted a couple of rare regulatory passes at year end, including loosened restrictions on holding derivatives and a two-year extension for banks to shed private equity and hedge fund holdings. Mary Thompson reports on what's ahead on the regulatory front for banks in 2015. Three and a half years after Dodd-Frank became law, a soon-to-be-installed Republican-controlled Congress is seen whittling away at parts of the massive Banking Reform Act in the new year. 
I think what you'll see some peel back on Dodd Frank and some some unity will be around maybe maybe raising the uh, the requirement as to what systemic what's a systemically important bank in the U.S. So the 50 billion may very well go to 100 billion. Republicans want to ease regulatory requirements for mid-tier banks while keeping the regulatory focus on the big banks Democrats like Senator Elizabeth Warren never want to bail out again. I haven't had anyone contact me and say what I'm really hoping for is that Congress will change the laws so the big banks can get a little more profitable. And if things blow up, the American taxpayer will pick up the bill. All the rules requiring banks to hold more capital, liquidity, and to dial down on risk taking have made banks safer, though potentially less attractive investments, according to PwC's regulatory expert, Dan Ryan. Are you going to want to invest in a business that has to hold 30 percent of its cash in reserve for a future date? In the near future, like the coming year, more rules on capital and risk taking will be written, including the final rule on additional buffers for global systemically important banks, limits on a bank's credit exposure to other banks, and a minimum long term debt requirement for big banks. Raising what's become the perennial question facing the industry, will the regulatory burden cause the big banks to break up? If the bank investors stay with these companies, I don't think we'll see breakups. If the equity markets kind of uh, dictate that valuations are too low and the, the, the breakup values more, I think that's where you'll see that come in. But with big banks still waiting for key rules to be written, being big is the easiest way to adjust to them. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mary Thompson. And to learn more about new banking regulations for 2015, go to our uh, website, nbr.com. Still ahead, common money mistakes that we all make, but there's still time to avoid them before the year is out. Well, after a four-decade ban, Uncle Sam may now start allowing U.S.-produced uh, oil to be sold overseas. Just today, a unit of the Commerce Department told several domestic oil producers that they should consider now exporting a form of crude oil called processed condensate to buyers outside the United States. Meantime, the price of oil closed higher today on expectations of a decline in U.S. inventories. Light sweet crude rose 51 cents, settled at $54.12 a barrel. Brent North Sea crude rose two cents. It closed at $57.90 a barrel. While U.S. oil production revs up, it's a different story at dozens of West Coast ports where a worker slowdown is costing companies millions of dollars, keeping shipments waiting days or even weeks to be offloaded. Jane Wells has more from the port of Los Angeles. It is a <laughs> traditional bed with contemporary touches on it. The port problems on the West Coast have gone Hollywood, even affecting actress Jane Seymour. This is dramatic. You know, this is bringing a piece of old Hollywood into your life. But if you want to buy it, you may have to wait. Seymour and her partner in the furniture business, Michael Amini, are just two of thousands of businesses impacted by the months-long contract negotiations, which have led to a slowdown in productivity at the nation's largest port complex, Los Angeles and Long Beach. Each side, terminal operators and dock workers, blames the other for the congestion, and Amini is furious. Every day we are losing money because a lot of consumers, they cancel their order if they can't get it and they go buy something else. The National Retail Federation says it appears contract talks have come to a screeching halt. Already, Lululemon reduced full-year revenue guidance due to inventory stuck in ports. And Taylor reported it had to ship some goods through more expensive air freight. And FedEx CEO Fred Smith says the port slowdown, quote, has been a much bigger deal than people think. Amini says he has 23 containers full of furniture stuck on these ships. And to try and reroute that inventory now isn't practical. It has been very, very challenging. He said he spent $4 million to be at a recent furniture show to show off new designs. And it was just the last show that uh, none of our samples made it because it got stuck in port. And it was a pretty big blow to our business. These are hidden panels. But from here to the mall to McDonald's, which may have to airlift Idaho potatoes to Japan for French fries, 
The only good news is the port has not completely shut down like it did in 2002. If that happens again, the National Retail Federation says it could cost the U.S. economy $2 billion a day. For Nightly Business Report, Jane Wells, San Pedro, California. Concerns about sales growth sent shares of Keurig Green Mountain lower today. That's where we begin tonight's market focus. Recent Nielsen data shows that the sales of the company's K-Cup coffee pods have experienced significant growth deceleration. An analyst from the research firm SunTrust, Robinson Humphrey, is concerned about that. He calls the results the slowest growth in recent memory. Shares of uh, Green Mountain Keurig dropped more than 2% today to $133.40. Department of Justice is reportedly examining Morgan Stanley's relationship with New Century Financial in the sale of subprime mortgages that were running up to the financial crisis. According to those reports, the DOJ and Morgan Stanley may reach a settlement early in the new year. Still, shares of Morgan Stanley were up a few cents to $39 a share. And shares of Civio cratered today, cutting the stock price in half. Investors got their first chance today to respond to the news late yesterday of a steep profit warning and the fact that the oil services firm would suspend its dividend. Demand for its services has dried up in the oil, as oil prices have dropped. Among the firm's biggest investors are hedge fund Jana Partners and Greenlight Capital. Look at this, stock plunging 52% all the way down to $3.92. Toyota may not reach its 2014 goal of selling more than one million vehicles in China. That's according to a report citing executives from the automaker. And that's because China's economy is slowing more than expected, resulting in a price war in the country's local car market. The stock was off 1 percent today to 125.91. Amazon has been ranked the most popular company in America. That's according to a survey conducted by the University of Michigan, which collected data from tens of thousands of interviews from consumers consumers, as well as other industry information. But Amazon stock was not popular with investors today. It lost $1.74 to $310 and change. And Apple really dominated the holidays this year. According to data from the mobile analytics company Flurry, more than half of all the smartphone activations in the week leading up to Christmas were Apple phones. And that's not just in the U.S., that's all around the world. Samsung accounted for only 18 percent of activations, despite that shares slumped today down 1 percent to $112.52. Well, it might be a little quick to be talking about uh, taxes. We have one more day left in this year, after all, but it's not too soon to start talking about making smart choices for the new year. Our next guest says, has some money tips that could save you a bundle come the tax season. She's Avani Ramnani. She's Director of Financial Planning at uh, Wealth Management with financial, uh, Francis Financial. Avani, good to see you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Let's talk. Uh, first of all, I mean, these are things you can do now that are doable that will help reduce your taxes for the new year, like minimize your capital gains taxes. How do you do that right away? Well, the stock market this year broke records. So you may have sold investments that have had huge gains. I'm here to tell you, you may be able to save on taxes on those gains. Let's say you have about $5,000 worth of gains. Look in your investment portfolio. Can you find investments that you can sell that have a $5,000 loss? If it makes sense for your portfolio, sell those investments, take the loss, and write it off against the gains. This way, you will avoid mm -hmm. paying the taxes and you can free up some money to put into better investments. Mm -hmm. Well, when you say free up money, and this is sort of counterintuitive, another one of your recommendations is buy that big ticket item right now. That just doesn't seem like the kind of thing you do at the end of the year. What's the advantage of doing that now? Well, the Congress recently extended some tax breaks uh, until tomorrow. And that, those tax breaks give you the option to either take a deduction on your state income taxes or sales taxes. So if you're in the market to purchase a, an item like a car, uh, in states especially where they don't have state income taxes, like Arizona, Florida, Texas, it might make sense to go in for the purchase because then you can write off that sales tax you will pay on that car. Believe it or not, you get a tax break for paying taxes. 
<laughs> yes, you do in some states. And I guess you know a lot of car uh, uh, lots will be wanting to sell those cars on the last day of the year anyway, so you get a good deal uh, to right. begin with. Make sure you take your required minimum distributions. That's very important, isn't it? Extremely. If you are over 70 and a half, you're required to take distributions or withdrawals from your retirement accounts. There is a minimum amount that the law requires. If you don't take these distributions, you get hit with a 50% penalty. So mm -hmm. let's say you're required to take $10,000 out. If you don't do it, the IRS will hit you with a $5,000 penalty. And why pay the IRS more than you need to? So I would say check with your uh, advisor and make sure you've taken those distributions. I would like to add, for people who have inherited retirement accounts from someone other than their spouse may also be subject to these minimum withdrawals. Mm -hmm. So call your advisor and make sure you've taken them. Well, you've given us a lot to think about and do for tomorrow. we got one day left. We can make <laughs> sure this happens. Avani, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and Happy New Year. And to you, too, as well. Thank you. And coming up on the program, a celebration at the New York Stock Exchange, 50 years in the making. That's next. It is a big problem for pet owners during the holidays. What to do with the family dog while you're on vacation? Well, now some startups are offering a solution. They run websites that connect pet owners with pet sitters. Josh Lipton has the story. Come on. Good puppies. There are 83 million dogs in the U.S., and when their owners go on vacation, they need a place to stay. Traditionally, that's meant going to a kennel, now there's an alternative. It's called Rover and it's easy to use. Go online, find a dog sitter and book a reservation at their house or they can come to yours. There are now 25,000 sitters available across the U.S. Rover's CEO says business booms during the holidays. Unlike the summer where people can travel throughout the summer, or during the holidays people travel on Thanksgiving and on Christmas. Um, so there's definitely a, a wave of people uh, looking to book, uh, but pretty much all the same days. Um, so it is a crazy time of year for us. Rover makes money by taking a 15% commission from its sitters, who typically charge $30 per night. The company has raised $25 million from investors such as Menlo Ventures. But Rover isn't alone in this market. There's also Dog Vacay, which has 20,000 dog sitters. It's already raised $47 million from top-tier venture capitalists such as Benchmark. Oh, come on. These investors know that Americans spend a lot of money on their pets, nearly $60 billion this year, according to the American Pet Products Association. The startups do have their critics, though, who say sitters pose a potential safety risk for pets. Just because sitters love dogs, they say, doesn't mean they're actually qualified to care for dogs. Still, Rover's Easterly counters that every pet sitter is verified and reviewed, and that dropping off your dog with a sitter beats leaving him in a kennel. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Josh Lipton in Silicon Valley. Working in the same place for 50 years might sound like a dead-end job for many people, but not if it's on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, where Art Cashin of UBS Securities has spent the last half century as one of the biggest movers and shakers in the markets. Today, to celebrate that milestone, Cashin rang the opening bell of the NYSE. Here's a look at some of Art's greatest moments through the last 50 years from the center of it all. You've, you know, basically spent your life here. How long have you been on the floor? I came down here in swaddling clothes. Arthur D. Cashin, December 30th, 1964. Here's the man himself. Arthur Cashin is here with us. Well, I've seen a great many things, uh, some very pleasant, some terrific rallies and stories, some not so pleasant. This is a civilization-changing event. Uh, certainly, you don't want to have terrorists appear victorious, but security's gonna change everywhere. You're beginning to hear people get a little bit more despondent as this continues to 
upsell day after day after day. This is stunning. People are avoiding all assets. It's a stampede to safety. So it's a little too early for the all clear signal. Often it's the second mouse who gets the cheese. We had a kind of a bipolar five days. This is a global crisis. Banks dropping like dominoes all around the globe, and that's got everybody worried. But I think we're in for several years of really tough sledding. This is another fine mess they've gotten us into. You gotta keep your eye on the referee. This game's not on the up and up. I don't know that it's time to open the bubbly quite yet. It sounded like he was not on the same page with uh, maybe some of his uh, confreres over there in Europe. We like your hat too, by the oh, way. Thank you, I finally got a chance to wear it. <laughs> That's why this game is not done by high school kids. When people are selling, particularly in a selling panic, they're very nervous and, and the noise level, the pitch goes up. So it's sold, sold as opposed to, take them, buy. Wait till the sun shines, Nelly. And, you know, despite today's decline, the S&P is about to wrap up its eighth straight quarterly gain, closing at 2080. And on this very day, 50 years ago, when our friend Art Cashin began his career at the New York Stock Exchange, the S&P closed at 84. 84. And, uh, just to save you from doing the math, that's 2,300 percent. That's if you bought it uh, the day he started. And Art told us today he bought the S&P the day he started, well, good but he him. sold it four days later. Oh. So, <laughs> so much 18. for precious. There is no finer gentleman on Absolutely. the floor. Absolutely. Right. And one thing I want to say when I saw him singing, you know, he wanted to have a, a career as a singer, but I think he made a better choice. I think he did. <laughs> he, he did very well. Well, that's it for us. Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Susie Garrow. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great evening, everybody. See you tomorrow. Nightly Business Report has been funded in part by... TheStreet.com and Action Alerts Plus, where Jim Cramer and fellow portfolio manager Stephanie Link share their investment strategies, stock picks, and market insights. You can learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. I'm Susie Garib with a nightly business report news brief. Only one more day of trading left in 2014, a year of unprecedented gains that saw the Dow break through the 18,000 mark and the S&P top 2,000 for the first time ever. But today, the Dow lost 55 points, closing back below that 18,000 level. The Nasdaq fell by 29, and the S&P was down by 10 points, retreating from yesterday's all-time closing high. After a four-decade ban, the Commerce Department is indicating that it might start allowing U.S. produced oil to be sold overseas. U.S. home prices rose 4.5 percent in October, the 11th month in a row of slowing price increases. And this year, 6.5 million Americans enrolled in a health care insurance plan through the healthcare.gov website. Be sure to tune in to Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station. <laughs>